transcript. Okay, testing, testing. There we go. <laughs> right. Hopefully the rest of the class are is watching the recordings. Overall, the class is doing well, so I'm going to hope that's the case. <clears throat> All right. So we left off last time talking about adding, subtracting, and multiplying functions, right? So just basically combining functions. And now these problems in this topic are also asking you to give the domains. So find f times g. And so notice here, they don't even put the f of x times g of x. It's just understood we're talking about f of x times g of x. And here, f of x minus g of x. And then to give their domains. And remember, in general, when we think about the domain, it's going to be all real numbers with exceptions. So all real numbers. Sorry, this, it's not pretty. <laughs> Except you know, we want to make sure. If we have a fraction, that you don't get a zero on the bottom. So that's one exception. Anything that makes the bottom zero. And then two, since we're talking about real numbers, right, real numbers, we want to make sure that in a square root, whatever's inside there cannot be negative. Okay, so, so far, that's what we've learned. And, you know, I'm also thinking in terms of, you know, we're going to be graphing functions. And remember the x-axis is really all of the real numbers. That's the real number line. So when we're graphing a function, you know, we want to know over what portion of the x-axis does the graph fall, you know? Where are there points for what x values? So that's really kind of also what we're, what we're thinking about. So when you combine functions, the domain, it's going to be all the numbers that work in both. Okay. And when numbers work in both, that means it works in F and G. All the numbers that work in F and G. So that's the intersection. The domain of F intersected with the domain of G. The domain of F intersected with the domain of G, right? So it's all reals that work in both. So to combine these, it's pretty straightforward, right? F times G, you just multiply them. And there's not really a lot else you can do here. I mean, technically we would normally write this in front in parentheses. But either way is fine. We need parentheses there too.
And for the domain, we need all the numbers that are gonna work in both because you can see both pieces are there. So for the domain of G, we'll look at that one first just because it's easier. For the domain of G, we don't have any of these restrictions. There's no fraction. We don't have to worry about a bottom. There's no square root. We don't have to worry about the radicand being non-negative. So here, that's all real numbers. I'll write a big capital R for all the reals. <clears throat> for F though, we have to make sure that what's inside is not negative. So this stuff inside has to be greater than or equal to zero. And you can further solve, add one to both sides and divide both sides by two. Okay, so the domain of F is all the real numbers that are greater than or equal to a half. And the domain of G is just all real numbers. So you're gonna take the intersection. Really, we need numbers that work in both. So it's really just all the real numbers that, oops, that are greater than or equal to a half. You know, again, I kind of think of starting with all the real numbers and then you start restricting it, right? Removing anything that doesn't work. So we know it has to be greater than or equal to a half. So that gets rid of all the rest. And you need to start, you know, at the one half. And it's all of these. Is, that, is all this making sense so far? So F minus G, we just take F, Okay. Yeah, that's all right. We just take F and minus G. So again, it's minus the whole G here. So you have to put it in parentheses. And then you can distribute that negative So it's minus 5x squared and then plus 3. And again, we just need numbers that work in this whole thing. So numbers that work in both. And it's going to be the same thing, the domain. It's all x's such that x is greater than or equal to a half. And it's asking you to use interval notation. So for these domains, it's one half, and we need to box that in because it's less, uh, greater than or equal to to infinity. Okay. So again, we start out thinking, well, let's just start with the whole real number line, all real numbers, and look for things that don't work, right? You can't have a negative in a radical. You can't have a zero on the bottom of a fraction. 
So you restrict the domain to just what's going to work. Okay, so let's see what um, Alex does to describe all of this. I don't want to leave some of what I wrote up. Okay, so suppose that f is a function with domain A and g is a function with domain B. So they're calling those domains capital A and capital B. And if you add, subtract, or multiply, or divide really, you take the intersection. And again, you just have to be careful when you divide, if you have a fraction that you remove any values of x such that the bottom equals zero. So that's all that that's saying. It's the set of all of those numbers minus the ones that make the bottom zero. All right, the set A intersect B is the intersection of sets. It's the set of all elements that are a member of A and a member of B, so it's a member of both. I kind of like my notation better. It just reminds us the domain, capital D, domain of F, domain of G, but whatever, capital A and capital B work. This is the difference of sets. It's a set of all of the elements that are in the intersection, but then they're not the ones that make the bottom zero. So you remove those, you restrict that whole set by removing these. Okay, so the domain of G, it's all real numbers. And for F, we found it's all the X's that are greater than or equal to a half. And again, you set what's inside greater than or equal to zero because it can't be negative. So again, I like to think of numbers as you know, being either zero they're positive or they're negative. If it can't be negative, that means it's zero or positive greater than or equal to zero. So I think it's nice to kind of connect these two so you're not just memorizing symbols, you know? Um, and there are no other restrictions, et cetera. So for F times G, and they just left it like that. The parentheses here and the domain, it's the restricted one because it has to work in both pieces. And same here, when you subtract, you distribute the negative and it's the restriction of both pieces. All right, so this is asking you to find the sum and the product and give the domains in interval notation. So when you add them, you can just add those two expressions, combine like terms, and you know, there's no restrictions on the domains here. There's no fraction, there's no radical, it's just all real numbers. Any real number will fit. And again, if I'm thinking of a graph, you know, a quadratic gives you some kind of a parabola and it just keeps going forever and ever in both directions. All X's are gonna work. And the other one, that's a line. And again, all X's are going to work. <clears throat> Put the Y axis up, <laughs> right? So for all of the points on that line, it goes infinitely in both directions. All the X's are going to be 
you know, kind of used up. So there are no restrictions on the domains on this one. Okay, you got a radical here, and it's asking you to find um, a quotient. So for F, the domain is all real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity. G, if you solve for what's underneath, and set that as greater than or equal to zero. Oops. X plus two greater than or equal to zero, and then subtract two from both sides. You get that the X that goes in there has to be greater than or equal to negative two. And that's an interval notation. So the intersection of those two is just the restricted part, is it has to work in both. Okay, now when you add these two, you can just add them, like the first expression and the second expression, and the domain is that restricted part. For F over G, Right, we start with that restricted part, but notice this was all for, you know, when we started, of course I just erased it. We said that X plus two was greater than or equal to zero. Right, because you can get zero inside a radical, but when you divide by G now, you can't have zero on the bottom, okay? And the only way to get zero on the bottom is when X is negative two. So you have to remove that one as well, okay? So, you know, you can kind of think, well, I already made the restriction for the radical, and now I have to remove the restriction for the division. Make sure you're not dividing by zero. So notice here, we've got the negative two is included with the square bracket. Here, the negative two is not included with the soft parenthesis. Okay. So try this one.
Okay, so the domain of F is all real numbers. The domain of G <clears throat> is that interval. And the intersection is that same interval because all real numbers was restricted to just that. And then when you divide, you have to also make sure that you take out any values that make the bottom equal to zero the bottom equals zero, you know, to solve for that, you know that the radical equals zero when the stuff inside equals zero. So subtract three, divide by five. So that's the value that makes the bottom equal zero. So you're gonna remove that from that restricted domain. And now you have the soft parenthesis around the negative three fifths. And when you subtract them, you're just still good with the original restricted domain to that interval. How is that grabbing you? Right on. Is this making sense how we restrict the domain? Or did I move too fast and you were still working? <laughs> Okay. All righty. Well, let's move on to composition. And this is another way of combining two functions. We say we can compose two functions. And the way that works we write it with a little circle in between, like here, that's Q composed with P and P composed with Q. So this is called a composition. And what this really means is that, you know, F is some function and you're gonna put G inside the function. So just for example, um, suppose, oops, suppose F is three X squared plus two, and suppose G, is 2x squared minus one. I'm just making something up. So find, how about find f composed with g? So 
So to do that, F composed with G, it means you're going to put G inside F. So everywhere there's an X, you're going to put a G. And G is 2x squared minus 1. And then, of course, you can factor that out, multiply it by 3, and add 2. This is what happens when I make an example. <laughs> I probably should have made both linear examples like they have here. You get minus 2x squared minus 2x squared is minus 4x squared plus 1. Just kind of showing you the process and then distribute the three. So you get plus three plus two is plus five. And then suppose you were asked to find F of G of one. Well, you have a function now for F of G. So now you're just going to put a one in it. Right. Everywhere there's an X you're going to replace it with a one. So you get 12 times one to the fourth minus 12 times one squared plus five. And one to the fourth is one. One squared is one. So you just get five. Is this making sense? So this is called composition. Okay. So here, you're being asked to find Q composed with P and P composed with Q both of one. So you just do it both ways. Right? F of G, it's F of G, it's the composition of F with G. Um, yeah, and you can actually do it this way also. And I wish I hadn't have erased all of mine. So you can, you know, kind of like we were doing before with adding functions and stuff. You know, you can actually find the P of one first and then stick that into Q. You could find, So either way, and this way is probably easier for these. You could also find, you know, this of x first. And then substitute the one in like I did before. But this probably is easier. You know, find the p of one first. And you get two. 
and then stick the two into Q. So we're working from the inside out. And then this way you do it the opposite direction. So notice the order. <clears throat> like here, F of G of X. Notice the order is the same. It's F of G of X. Okay. You know, both ways work. I, I do think for these, this way is easier since we're, you know, I would say if you have to evaluate at a lot of different values, like find P of Q of one, find P of Q of five, find, find Q, P of Q of 10, you know, then it's easier to just find P of Q of X first and substitute in the one, two, five, and 10. Yeah. So let me um, do one this way. All right. So find P of Q of seven. So that means P of Q of seven. And Q of seven is the square root of 16, which is four. So that's P of four. And then put the four into P. I'm like, do I need another color? Maybe, maybe it's too much. <laughs> so P of four, you get four squared plus six, which is 16 plus six or 22. And then Q of P of seven. Is now Q of P of seven. All right, so that means put P of seven into Q. So what is P of seven? Seven squared plus six, forty nine plus six, or fifty five. And this means put fifty five into Q. So Q is the square root and now it's 55 plus 9 so that's the square root of 64 which is 8 okay How was this grabbing you? You know, if you just do one step at a time, writing it, you know, like this, 
and work from the inside out like we always do when we're doing even order of operations, we work from the inside out. Okay, so try this one. Okay, so U composed with W of negative five. <clears throat> it's nice to write it like this. And W of negative five is negative 24. So replace that. And then U of negative 24, just stick the negative 24 into U and you get 19, and then here it is the other way. So notice that the order of the composition makes a difference. It turns out that if two functions are inverses of each other, when you compose both ways, you get the same thing. <clears throat> but in general, it's not true. And they point that out here. As we see, it may not be the case that f of g equals g of f. <clears throat> okay, do you wanna try another one? Okay. This will wake you up. <laughs>
And so here we go. R of Q of eight and Q of R of eight. Okay. 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 You know, I was realizing on this transcript, <clears throat> it seems to never put a question mark. What do I have to do to my voice to get a question mark? How are you? Just testing. There you go. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Maybe it has to look like a question as well as sound like one. Okay. For each of the following equations, determine whether y is a function of the x. And so <clears throat> remember for a function, we learned that for each x, there is exactly one y. And we also saw the vertical line test. If you graph the function, any vertical line will only cross once. Um, so they say here, for y to be a function of x, each value of x, so that's for each x, <clears throat> it must correspond to just one value of y. So I like my little shorthand because I feel like it's easier to kind of remember. <clears throat> so here are some examples. We know that, you know, these lines give you linear functions. You can also have um, a parabola. Right? Things that are not functions, you know, when you have the y squared, these actually give you a parabola kind of turned on its side. We didn't really, we don't really learn that in this class, but it's the truth. <laughs> you know, you, just like y equals x squared, you get a parabola that opens upward or downward. When you have a linear x, and a quadratic y, you end up with a parabola turned on its side. And so these fail the vertical line test. Right, so notice all of the y squareds here. Okay, so those are not functions. So for the current example, You know, this is not a function. And this is not a function. And this is a linear function. This is a linear function, right? We can solve these for y. If this is already solved for y, we can solve that one for y. So that's it. And just, you know, so we can kind of distinguish between functions and relationships that are not functions. OK. 
Okay, so that's not a function. This is a function. You could solve it for y as a function of x. This is not a function. This is a function that gives you a parabola. Okay. So that's it with these. It's nice though to have that, you know, kind of broader understanding. Okay. So these two are not functions. And these two are. Okay. And now we get into inverse functions. And maybe this is actually a good time to take a break because we're kind of starting a whole new area. So let's take a break and we'll come back at 10.05. We'll see you in a bit. Hi, we're back. <laughs> okay, we're moving on. So now we're gonna look at these inverse functions <clears throat> and the horizontal line test. Get this stuff moved around here again. Okay, so to be a function for each x, there is one y. And there's the vertical line test. And now we're going to talk about one-to-one -one functions. <clears throat> so we really just say, you know, we already know it's a function, but now we want to know, is it a one-to-one -one function? So one-to-one -one functions are already functions. I usually write one-to-one -one like that. One, two, one. <clears throat> so now for a function to be one to one, it's true that for each y, there is one x. So taken together, for each x, there's one y, and for each y, there's one x. And if a function is one to one, then it passes what's called the horizontal line test. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But so the idea is, you know, for each x, There's one y, and for each y, there's one x. So there's really this, you know, kind of pairing that happens for every element. Maybe I'll say like x2, y2. So it's a one-to-one -one function. They're paired off. So let's just see how um, Alex explains this. A function is one-to-one -one if and only if no two points on the graph have the same y-coordinate, right? Because y has exactly one x with it. For each y, there's one x. And we already know for each x, there's one y. 
So there's no two points that have the same Y coordinate. So for example, suppose the graph contains these two points, 0, 5, and 4, 5. It can't be one to one since the 5 has been paired with two different x's. And notice that those two points both lie on the horizontal line, y equals five. <clears throat> and so we can actually use a horizontal line test to see if a function is one-to-one. -one. So the horizontal line test, much like the vertical line test, says, you know, the line can only cross through once for it to be one-to-one. -one. So like here, notice this horizontal line has already crossed four times. So this fails the one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, test, the horizontal line test. And same thing here, this parabola, horizontal lines cross more than once. So this function is not one-to-one. -one. This graph, however, this is a one-to-one -one function because any horizontal line that I draw through the graph will only cross one time. Notice a vertical line will only cross once also because it's a function. So again, we're already told it's a function, so we already know it's gonna pass that vertical line test, but I'm just saying, okay? Here's another example of a graph that passes that horizontal line test. Any horizontal line will only cross once. And here, any horizontal line will only cross once. And here, any horizontal line will only cross once. Same with the vertical lines, right? It's already a function, we know that. Okay. So how about our graph one here? Does that pass the horizontal line test? Is it a one-to-one -one function? That's a fail. You're right. And how about this one? That's also a fail. And how about this one? That one passes. And this one? That's going to fail, right? Horizontal lines cross more than once. So I wrote all over that. And how about the next one? This one is good. And this one is good, right? Okay. Do one more just in case. Use a different color so it stands out a bit. How about the first one? Nope, right here, it violates the test. And this one, nope. And this one, nope. And how about graph four? This one is good, right? Since that's an open circle, 
a vertical line here only crosses once and everywhere else it's pretty clear. And graph five, it's a big no. And graph six, that's a no. Okay. So it can be useful to know if functions are one to one. <clears throat> because one to one functions have inverses. So let's see. Determining whether two functions are inverses of each other. As I was saying earlier, if the composition gives you the same thing both ways, they basically just undo each other. Then the two functions are inverses of each other. And they have to both be true. They have to both be true. So here's an example worked out. You're given f and you're given G for problem A, and you're asked to find F of G, and then find G of F, and then are they inverses or not? Okay, so here's F and here's G. So F of G means you're gonna put G right inside of F, right? and G is X of two. So when you put X of two in for X, you get X plus two minus two, and that just gives you back X. And then when you try it the other way, this now says put F everywhere there's an X, right? You're gonna substitute that in for X. So when you put that in, you get X minus two and then plus two and the twos cancel out and you're left with just X. <clears throat> Therefore, they are inverses of each other, okay? So for this one, we're told in both cases, X can't be zero. And you're asked to find F of G. So you're gonna put G into the F function. So that's the input of the X, uh, F function. <laughs> and the threes cancel. When you divide by a fraction, you can invert the second and multiply, right? And now you're left with negative X. As soon as you get one that's not X, I mean, really, you can stop right there because they both have to give you exactly X. So here they actually show, right? It's the top divided by the bottom. So you invert this and multiply. So again, as soon as you get something that's not exactly just X by itself, then you know that they are not inverses of each other. Okay, so try these two. You're going to do the composition both ways. You don't have to indicate the domain. And just see if they're inverses.
Okay, so here's the first one. We put G into X. Choose cancel and you're left for X, left with X. <laughs> and then here you put F into G. So you put that into the input. Choose cancel again and you're left with X. So those two functions are inverses. And then here's the second one done the same way. And those turned out to be inverses also. Are those okay? Okay, you want to try another one? Okay. Here you go. There's the first one. And here's the second one. And again, as soon as you see one does not give you X, you know they're not inverses. It might ask for the, oh, it asks you to find them anyway. So you have to find them both. Oh, 
Okay. These are good. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, these problems are asking you to find the inverse of a value and the composition of a function and its inverse of a value. So this is kind of like the, the pictures I've been drawing, you know, all along. Right, so if F takes a value X and maps it to a Y, Right, this first space is the domain of F, and the second space is the, called the range of F, the Y values. Then the inverse function <clears throat> undoes that path. You know, it takes the Y back to the X. So this now is called F inverse of Y. And this space is, you know, the domain and range have gotten reversed. This is now the domain of that inverse function. And this space is the range of the inverse function. So x is the same as the inverse of y. Okay, and vice versa. So they, they in, undo each other. <laughs> so if you look at this example, you know, G is the set of these points. And so let me just draw here. Right, so G takes, say, negative three to negative eight. And one gets mapped to four. And four gets mapped to nine. and five gets mapped to negative six. So the inverse function goes the opposite direction. Right, the negative eight gets mapped to the negative three. The four gets mapped to the one. The nine gets mapped to the four. And the negative six gets mapped to the five. So to find G inverse of four, right, you're looking at the inverse function. This is the domain over here of the inverse function. And if you put four into the input, Right, you get the one. So you're looking for the y value that x gets mapped to. Okay, and notice how this function is one to one. Negative three goes to negative eight, and negative eight is only paired with negative three. Notice there are these little like isolated pairs. They go hand in hand, like couples, <laughs> like penguins who mate for life. Okay. And 
And then, okay, so they must ask, yeah. So there's a general method for finding an inverse. Um, and since the domain and the range get switched, basically what happens is the X and the Y get switched. So the steps for finding an inverse are given here. You know, first we're gonna call the function Y and then you switch the X and the Y. So everywhere there was a Y, you're gonna call it X and everywhere there's an X, you're gonna call it Y. And then you just solve for Y. And that is your inverse function. Okay. So once you find that inverse function, right, the inverse of three, you can put the three in there and you get 15 minus eight is seven. And then H of seven, gives you three. So like it says, all of this is a lot of work <laughs> because when you compose a function with its inverse, as long as it's one-to-one, -one, you're gonna get back the original value, right? It's like, You know, if you start at negative three and put it in G, and then you take the inverse, you're gonna be back at negative three. Or if you start with the inverse of say four, you're gonna get one. And then if you compose it with G, you're gonna be back at four. Okay, so this is all true as long as the function is one-to-one. -one. And why is it one-to-one? -one? If you graph it, it looks like this, right? This is actually a line. If you wrote that in slope intercept form, right? Divide each of the top by five, you get one fifth X plus eight over five. That is a line and it passes the horizontal line test, right? It also passes the vertical line test. It's a one-to-one -one function. Okay. Is all this kind of making sense? Okay. So I'll just show another one. Um, it's asking you to find the inverse of zero, um, H inverse, and then the composition of those two of negative one. Okay. So here's G, G inverse has all the same points with their coordinates reversed. So when you look at the inverse function and you put zero in there, you get four. Okay, so you could also look at this and tell, you know, it's the X that gets mapped to zero. And then again, to find an inverse function, you know, call your function y. Switch your x and y. Solve for your new y. And that is your inverse function.
because you've switched all the X's and Y's. Okay. So call HY, switch the X and Y, solve for the new Y, and this is your inverse function. If you get an inverse function, it's one to one. And so even though you could compute it directly, you can just say you get the same thing. Back. This kind of goes in more detail about why that. Okay, so try this one. Asked in the different order this time, sorry. <laughs> Wasn't paying attention.
are these good? Yeah, so basically when you compose these two functions, they just undo each other. Um, let me see. Color domains, okay. So G inverse composed with G of negative two, it means G inverse of G of negative two. Right, so you think about what is What is G of negative two? I mean, you could put negative two in here and you get and you get one. And so G inverse is what goes this way. So when you put one into G inverse, you get back negative two. You could see that that works by putting the negative one in here. Not, neg uh, not negative one, sorry, one. I don't know why I'm saying negative one. Okay. So you could go through that work, but again, just having a function and its inverse, it's always gonna take you right back. So as long as the two functions are one-to-one -one functions, because again, those one-to-one -one functions, you know, those two numbers are like paired for life. <laughs> if you have a one, you're only gonna get a negative two. If you have a negative two in that function, you're always just going to get one. So no matter what order you compose them, you're going to get back to where you started. So what, you know, the bottom line is whatever number this is, you're going to get back the same exact number. And that's what we saw before, where if two functions were inverses of each other, you know, when you compose them, you get X, you get back the same thing. Both ways. So no matter what you start with, if you go one way and then come back, you're exactly where you started. If you start here and you took the inverse of G first, you'd get negative two. And then if you took G of that, you'd get back to one. Does that make sense? 
Or is it kind of hard to wrap your head around that one? <laughs> okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I've been looking at all this for years. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think practice is good in thinking through like what's happening, you know, until it kind of sticks. You want to try another one? How about this one? I like how you're always willing to work more. Okay, yeah, that's, that's fair, Lauren.
Well, how about this one? Is this one okay? Okay, so, I mean, basically these two cancel each other out. As soon as you know that the inverse exists, then H and H, H is a one-to-one -one function. <coughs> and so, I mean, really, See, so H composed with H inverse means H of H inverse of negative one. So if you look at this, H inverse of negative one. So that means you're putting negative one into an inverse function. And it gives you some value. We could find out what it is by putting it in here. But regardless of what value you get, once you take H of that, it's going to take you right back to negative one. So does that make sense? Without even calculating that, it takes you right back to negative one. So you can calculate it. You get two. And then H of two gives you negative one. You see what I'm saying there? So no matter what that number is, once you, you know, undo everything that H inverse did, <laughs> you're back to the same exact value. So that's why we say, you know, if, if you have a one-to-one -one function, well, okay, I'll use H. No matter what you put in there, you're gonna get X. You're gonna get the same thing out both ways. If you put a 2 into H, and then you take the inverse of that, you're back at 2. Does that make sense? So you don't even have to go through all of this, as long as you understand that the two together undo each other. And if you start at negative 1, you end at negative 1. Okay. So like... G of G inverse of one is one. These two undo each other. You start at one, you end at one. As you go up, you go back, and you're back at one. Doesn't matter which, yeah. Doesn't matter, you know, which one you do first. And so here, you start at negative three, you're going to end up right back at negative three. No. Doesn't matter which way you go, but you're going to end up right back at negative three. Okay. You're welcome.
Okay. All right, find the inverse and state the domain and range in interval notation. Okay, so we already know the steps <clears throat> for finding an inverse function, those four steps. And then to find the domain and range, it's just gonna be the reverse of the domain and range of the original one. Okay, so first they go through and they show, right, to find the inverse. So first you call Fy, and then you switch the X and the Y, and then you go through the steps and solve for Y, right? Multiply both sides by the Y minus seven, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's your inverse function. Okay. So for the domain, we have to make sure that the bottom of this function is not zero. So the domain is all real numbers that are not eight. So we can write that in interval notation as the interval from negative infinity up to eight, don't include the eight. Union the eight, don't include the eight to positive infinity. So that might seem like a lot of writing to express that idea, all real numbers except eight. And then the range, again, is the domain of the original function. So the original function can't have seven. It was all real numbers except for seven. Okay. So that's the old idea. So first we'll find the inverse function. So remember, call GY. Then switch your X and Y. <clears throat> now we're going to solve for Y. So multiply both sides by the bottom. Distribute over here. Now I'm going to add, I'm going to try and get all the Y stuff on the left and everything else on the right. So I'm going to add 7Y to both sides. and subtract X from both sides. And now I can factor the Y out. And then divide both sides by the stuff in parentheses. So this is the inverse function, G inverse. Oops, yeah. Okay, and for the domain, 
It's all real numbers except where the bottom is zero. So the seven plus two X can't be zero. We can find what X makes it zero. So it's all real numbers except for that one. So we go from negative infinity up to negative seven halves. Don't include the negative seven halves. And then start again at the negative seven halves, but don't include it to positive infinity. And then for the range, the range is the same as the domain of the original function. It equals the domain of G. So we can't have the bottom equal to zero. And again, it's all the real numbers except for that one. So you're going to write an interval notation from negative infinity to negative a half, and then from negative a half to positive infinity. OK. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, and our time is up. <laughs> I'm just talking away here, talking away. So we shall stop here, and I hope you have a really nice weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Hope you have a nice weekend, too. See you Monday. Okay, I'll see you Monday. All right, bye.